Thank you very much. Um, uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm Alicia Gonzalez from National Geographic Institute of Spain. Uh, I'm a geography engineer, and I, nowadays I'm uh, in charge of um, transfer data in this organization. So with this presentation, I will to show you the work that uh, we are um, now doing just to create an inspired transport network database from uh, the existing data. So first of all, um, I'm going to start just with uh, an introduction to justify why we are doing this. Secondly, uh, I, I'll focus on the, the work that we have done in the data model definition. Um, next, uh, how have we have defined the data production planning and just to finish the state of the play the, of the first version of this database and some conclusions. So why? Why we have decided to do it? Um, so far, the IEN Spain production uh, has been based on uh, cartographic products because uh, by law we have to provide um, topographic uh, information at different scales. So we have uh, also an street map and pro uh, products at different scales, but all of them share some topics, normally the reference information like transport, transport, hydrography, but uh, everyone has uh, their own spatial and temporal update schedule. And moreover, uh, the update planning are more focused, depending on the case, but uh, it's quite general that the, it is focused on uh, update the geographical area more than uh, geographical objects. So the consequence is that um, it's really difficult uh, to provide one unique thematic layer in this case, transport, uh, containing the most accurate, the most complete, and the richer uh, and adapt update data. So this is on one hand. But on the other hand, uh, IGN has to provide an inspired compliant answer regarding transport. So how, uh, how has uh, it worked uh, so far? Uh, well, we have uh, worked, I think, in a quite common way, as many of you, I suppose. So first of all, identifying the, the IEN datasets uh, which contain the most representative information regarding transport. <coughs> Secondly, yes, all the mapping process that everyone has suffered. <laughs> and, and comparing uh, our data model and inspired data model, we have two maybe evidences, the two evidence cons uh, conclusions. The first one is that uh, any national uh, data set isolated is not as com uh, complete as a uh, transport inspired uh, data model. But on the other hand, some national data sets are richer, contains more information than uh, inspired uh, data model in a specific uh, topic. So, so far we have uh, been able to provide uh, only the map, uh, map data according to inspired schema uh, by means of different web services. Regarding uh, visualizing, uh, nowadays we provide one, only one um, service, or you may service, Inspire Compliant, and this is the URL, and this is the, the um, layers that we are able to provide with the Trooper trial. Uh, by default, it's Inspire per trial, but user can choose, or can, yes, can choose the, the cartography or the national per trial. So um, this is the, the state of the play, uh, and, and we think and we feel that uh, user requirements on transport maybe are not being uh, fully satisfied. Because on one hand, uh, on one hand, the, the answer from inspired compliant answer is not quite uh, rich, and on the other hand, we have a lot of information but it's split in different projects. So. Uh, in March 2014, uh, IGN mm, of Spain decided to, to undertake a new production strategy. And it consists just to design and create the geographic reference information on transport, in this case. So on, on, all, all, on other topics, but in this case on the transport. This database has to be inspired compliant, of course. But also, in the definition of the data model, we have to consider all the nation data sell, national data sets requirements regarding transport. Because when this database will be finished, 
the different um, products, national products, has be fed from this database. And as it is reference information, the data uh, should be as much accurate and updated as it's feasible. So with um, this very big um, box of requirements, technicians started to, to work. And the first of all, of all was just to the definition, data model definition. Uh, we, we split in several uh, phases. The first one was just to analyze. We have to analyze the different data model of all our products and, uh, and mapping one with another to detect the common future types or attributes or requirements. We also uh, took into account the exchange data model on topographic data between IEM and the Spanish uh, regions cartography agencies because we have to assure and to maintain the data flow with them. And also, we detect the, uh, the, the most important pro official providers regarding transport, like road ministry or the railway manager. So yes, has to keep also this um, data flow. The first result of this analysis is was just the identification of the futures, attributes, values, and relationship just to, to um, just to satisfy the IGN products and also to keep the, the data flow with the provider and the stakeholders. The second phase uh, was just to study and inspire a data model. So um, from that, uh, we identified the, stronger, the strongest uh, inspired requirements. First of all is that all transport information has to be a network data model. So far, uh, we have information, the roads transport network is, yes, it is modeled with a network data model, but not the rest of the information. The rest of the information is cartography. Um, we have to take into account the five uh, transport modes, so it's huge. And also, the uh, infrastructure has to be linked to the uh, network, so because we have information of the transport uh, infrastructure, but from a cartography point of view, not connected to the link, to the network. And finally, the most maybe difficult requirement just to, to fulfill is the intermodal connection. We don't have any, any product, any information regarding that. So comparing this requirement and also with the local or with, the, with our data set requirements, we uh, obtained the second result. It's just uh, the starting point to define our new conceptual uh, transport conceptual model. The first phase uh, was, okay, our application schema, of course, must be Inspire compliant. So this is the, the name that we have done, IGNE Transform Network, and it has been built from Inspire application schema of Transform Network. So we decided that the best way is just uh, it, it was just uh, a start from Inspire application schema. So we did, we download the um, EAP files from a GRC a website, and then we import it in enterprise architect software. So, so here you have a, yes, a picture with, it doesn't work. Okay, <laughs> at the top, I don't know if we did again. Here, you can see? No, okay. At the top, uh, on, the, on the right, you can see, uh, yes, the different application schemas from Inspire application schema that we imported. And in the, uh, in the bottom part, uh, this is uh, the uh, Spanish trans transport network application schema. At the beginning, it was a copy from one from another. But after that, we started to add in our local requirement so in the same way as in this part regarding transport, we also have created, this is a pity. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we also have uh, created uh, one application schema per uh, transport mode, like in Spire, and also one for the common transport. So we started from this schema and we added our uh, local requirements. It implies that we, we have to extend the model or some values from the code list on some specific changes. Uh, 
We have a documented this application schema in uh, specifications and also with UML diagrams in a quite similar way as in Inspire specific specifications. So we provide diagrams just at network level and also with every properties linked to the, the transport leak element or the transport link set features and also the properties associated to the infrastructure. So this, this schema or this structure is common for the five uh, transport modes. Here in this picture, is, that is a, a, an extract or part of the UML of road. Oh. <laughs> So I don't know if you can see, but uh, um, at the bottom part of the picture, the, the classes are being colored because they are extension from our model. So just to identify the differences or the extension of uh, the national schema, schema friend, inspired schema has been identified. Also, we have added, I don't know, this thing work. Okay, we have also uh, added some comments just to specify the inspired values that they are applicable uh, to our uh, data. All this information are available in these well, in these uh, URLs. Um, uh, we have done yes, the specification. The application schema is documented by uh, UML diagrams and also with the feature catalog. And we have uh, added also an annex where we we provide information regarding the uh, database implementation because the conceptual is one model, but we can implemented in several ways. So we have, we already provide this kind of information, yes, with the mapping table uh, with Inspire. So, uh, so far it has been just the, the work that we have done uh, modeling, in the modeling point of view. But yes, uh, we have to put in practice, and now uh, we are going to see, yes, the data production planning. Two, okay. <laughs> Okay, uh, the geographic reference information production planning has been defined to be carried out into phases. The first one is just uh, to create the first version of the database with the existing uh, data. So we have to detect and check the, the, better, the best data in every product, yes, to create our, um, our transport data. <laughs> database. The second phase is, yes, once uh, we have this kind of information, we have to improve this uh, data in accuracy and we have to update because when we achieve that, all the national products will be fed from this database. So now we are involved in the first one uh, step, but we are also researching in the second one. How is the, yes, have a look to the first version. Of course, it's an integration of the existing data, but also according to the new application schema uh, requirements. And it's implied that we have to add new features, new relations like intermodal connection. It has been a challenge because we have to uh, produce uh, data all over Spain in less than two years. So um, the state of the play currently is that uh, the production phase is uh, already finished and now we are in quality control phase. And on, at the same time, we are just also implementing the um, web services to provide this information inspired compliant. So just to illustrate the result, here, well, <laughs> I can sign. Okay, here you can see yes the transport uh, the road transport network road uh, outside in countryside and they enter in the city are are connected with the with the street and also we have the railway network and also the ports and also the airports and everything is connected are connected. So here with more detail yes in urban area here you can see the railway the streets and everything. So, just to finalize, I would like to conclude, or maybe to say a reflection. Um, to be inspired compliant doesn't imply a, a, a new production data. As I explained at the beginning, we have been able just to provide an inspired compliant answer. But we think uh, it could be motivated just uh, to rethink, yes, mainly to the uh, cartography agencies, agencies to uh, rethink about a traditional uh, production methodology, mainly on um, geographical reference information. Yes, of course, to be more efficient, 
like uh, um, according to inspired principle uh, because there are evidence. But what I think is more important is just to provide data and services on transport that users are required currently. So users want a continuous and accurate and update transport network data. So that's all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this interesting example. Um, first of all, are there questions from the audience? Please raise your hand if you have questions. You can also come afterwards. Um, I spotted that this actually is an extension of the, of the Transport Networks team. And I would like to ask if you are aware of the ongoing activity actually to, uh, uh, to collect implementation ex uh, examples of extensions to share them with the community. Mm -hmm. So you are aware of that. Um, I would like to ask you uh, if it is possible, uh, not too much work, to contribute your work to this activity so that others can see, especially as I saw it's well documented with UML uh, and everything, I also have the schemas and will provide uh, live, uh, live services for touching and, uh, and feeding the data. That would be really great. Uh, okay. And if there are no more further questions, thank you very much again. Okay, thank you very much. So now we have a slight change of the agenda because it would be very odd if the chair also has a presentation. So this is a result of me not being able to change the, the main contributor of the next presentation. So we swapped internally. Uh, Stefania Morone from uh, uh, Epsilon Eat Higher, thank you very much, uh, will have this presentation instead of me. What is it? Here? So it's there. Yes. yes. Uh, which is mine? Which is yours? The, uh, the last there. one. Okay. I can see, but you can't. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Um, slideshow from current slide. Ah, okay. <laughs> so, here we are. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Stefania Morone from Epsilon Italia. I have the pleasure to share uh, with you um, results of a feasibility study uh, carried out in cooperation with the European Environment Agency, uh, KU11 University, and we transfer and of course, Epsilon Italia, to which uh, I belong. Um, <clears throat> so we will see um, if it was possible uh, to derive from the uh, source data, um, view and download services serving Inspire GML dataset compliant uh, to Inspire data models at pan-European level. Uh, we will see uh, the methodology we adopted uh, and which were the results of the validation of the produced GML dataset and uh, if it was possible to set up a view and download services and uh, which kind of uh, features were served. So do they validate against the, the scheme, the relevant schema again. So we will see all of this in this presentation. Uh, which was the scope of this feasibility study? Uh, to assess to what extent some of the most uh, used software tools are able uh, to provide and consume inspire conformant data through view and download services. And the focus uh, has been given on assessing the feasibility of setting up the service themselves and the validation of served data uh, more than validation of the services. Uh, though uh, um, we uh, also test the, net, the, um, the test server that we used against the performance and the square requirements on performances. All the documentation is uh, available on the uh, AONET platform, so search for AONET uh, 
uh, Europa yeah, Inspire activities, or if it's, it is more comfortable for you, search on the Inspire thematic clusters, uh, biodiversity cluster and land use clusters, because relevant uh, discussions have been posted and the links have been provided uh, with the aim to share what we learned uh, and to uh, have feedback, if possible, uh, from communities, but uh, above all from uh, uh, software developers uh, whose help is so needed. So, uh, which was our INSPIRE harmonization process methodology? So, how do we get from uh, source data to view and download services for INSPIRE GML datasets? Uh, first of all, the test data, our source data that was um, actually three different typologies of data. Uh, Corel and Cover 2006, in which we have a huge number of uh, uh, small, medium-sized features, and relevant inspired data model is complex in this case. Conversely, we then test a, a data set for which uh, uh, a small number of features is involved, because in this case we are uh, speaking about biogeographical region data set, uh, but these features are very huge, uh, millions of vertices involved in the polygons, and a relevant inspired data model in this case is quite simple if compared to the land cover vector one. And then uh, the other typology is CDDA, so Common Database on Designated Areas, uh, because it is an Inspire extended data model. So is it possible to provide GML compliant to Inspire for uh, CDDA data? Is it possible to set up services and so on? We tried to answer these questions. Um, we followed uh, two different paths in which we used only open source software, and in uh, another one, we used also proprietary software. Um, so, from source data, we transformed our source data by means of the HAIL transformation software tool, and uh, we started from Shapefile or SQLite. When both were available, we tried both as a source, so, and uh, we uh, arrived to the conclusions that it's the same thing um, uh, as regards the results. But if you start from a shapefile or SQLite file or PostGIS table, uh, the results is the same, so you are able to derive uh, the correct GML data. Once we obtained GML data set, we uh, performed a validation against the INSPIRE requirement. We will see later in dedicated slides which kind of validation was performed. And then we uh, set up uh, web services, so view and download services, uh, by means of degree and uh, GeoServer and we will see which were the results also in this case. And then we tested the usability of GML datasets produced and uh, WFS and WMS in GIS environment. As open source, we used the quantum GIS. And then we repeated the exercise using also proprietary software, so ArcGIS products. So, um, it has to be said that, just one minute to say that, we, uh, for the transformation, we reused matching tables already provided in previous projects. For example, for Land Cover, the Eagle project, the CDDA uh, and Inspire project, and so on. So we reused uh, already compiled uh, and validated matching table. Um, so our, we then, um, we are, all is documented, so please download the documents, read them, comment on them, let us know, because I don't have now the, the time to get into details of the transformation. So I got directly to uh, validation results of, for GML dataset. First of all, which kind of validation was used for the GML dataset? 
we know that uh, inspired data validation is much more than validation against the schema requirements. Each uh, uh, data team has got its ATS, so many uh, abstract tests and conformance classes, and application schema tests is just one test of one conformance class of many conformance classes. And uh, so, uh, by means of HAIL, we are already uh, able to have a first uh, uh, validation, so it's a validation against the schema requirements, and it, uh, it is also a live validation if you enable the, the, the feature in Hale, and this is a very good thing to do, uh, please use, because uh, it uh, uh, helps you understanding if you're going the right direction with your mappings. So, by means of Hale, we just had a schema validation, but we wanted to have more. So then we used the EMV Plus validation service, which is an online tool for validation of GML dataset. It's uh, completely free. And uh, it uh, provides, of course, a validation against the schemas, the GML schemas, uh, of course, and all the schemas defined in the GML documents, so the inspired data team application schema. And uh, um, it goes deeper in the validation because it also provides a validation of the requirements that cannot be encoded in an XSD because they cannot be expressed by means of XML schema grammar, such as, for example, um, in the case of GML specification, the geometry requirement. So the ISO uh, 19107 requires that the boundaries of the polygons must be counterclockwise. This cannot be tested, for example, in an XSD. We need something else. So uh, the EMV Plus validation service, which is based on uh, OGC GML test suite, validates all requirements of the GML uh, specification, so the ISO 19136, uh, by means of a schematron and also test and G tests. And EM Plus is more than this because it provides also uh, team specific schematron targeted on Inspire uh, data teams. And uh, we are able, by means of these schematrons, to validate requirements that are not encodable in a schema such as code list values, just to cite one. So, um, just to use also a proprietary tool also for the validation, we used the oxygen. Five minutes, I have to go. Then, uh, reusing the schema of the EMV Plus uh, platform, and we are, uh, results are very comforting, as you can see. Uh, they pass both uh, schema and schema validation, so we are able to find. Go. Um, Dataset usability in a QGIS environment. You can see here that we are able to see uh, the geography, so the land cover unit in this case. And we are able to visualize the structure of the GML and the information of the GML, uh, provided that we use the correct tools. We have to use the GML loader plugin and GML complex info. So it's not sufficient just to drag and drop the GML. If you want to see the GML structure and want to be able to have access to all the fields. So the biographical regions, CDDA, we, are, we were able to use them quite comfortably. Uh, just one tips. Uh, to, if, if you want to use proficiently in GIS environment, the Corinne land cover uh, data set, so land cover vector uh, GML data set, be, pay attention to map the member association in the correct way. You have to use by reference mapping option. Ask me later because otherwise if I lose more time, I guess Chris is going to push me away. Uh, Ask me later. Anyway, it's all documented in the PDF, download, and let us know. So, view and download, the view and download services set up. Okay, we use Degree, GeoServer, and ArcGIS server. Um, as, as you can see, uh, we could derive uh, uh, 
um, only land cover um, service for ActGIS because no support is given for Annex 3 biogeographical region and for extended schemas. But uh, I'm quite comfort comforting also this uh, slide because as you can see, we were able to set up uh, services for all the themes in degree and in GeoServer. Uh, just to mention, to uh, create uh, view download services in GeoServer, we use HAIL uh, and up schema feature in HAIL, which lets you uh, directly upload uh, your features in uh, GeoServer instance. Um, we had uh, a problem with GeoServer with WMS in the CDDA case. And uh, um, it is, oh, as I've said previously, it is all documented. Uh, I can tell, but I don't know if we have time, otherwise ask me later in the question time. And uh, um, we validated also uh, GML features served by means of WFS. And as you can see here, uh, the situation has changed. Okay, using and validating directly the uh, GML dataset, we were able to uh, pass validation against the schema and against the schematron. But here we tested again, of course, using WFS uh, get feature uh, request and in the EMV Plus validation service and also in Oxygen. And uh, we, what did we understand? That uh, schema validation is ensured, but we failed uh, in schematron validation in, in all three cases for land cover. And why? We fail because of this constraint, uh, which is in the data specification for land cover. Geometry is kind of GM point or GM surface, requiring that uh, the geometry is derived from GM surface. So the polygon is in a polygon patch. So what we find out is that none of the uh, services we used uh, was able to handle this kind of geometry. Uh, actually, also here, there are different reasons. And uh, for example, degree is able to ingest the GML having the uh, GM surface encoding for geometries. But then uh, when you serve the feature, uh, polygon patch disappear. You have just GML polygons. So you fail validation against the schema trends. Um, so this slide show that you are able to use WFS service features in a quantum GIS environment, provided that you use the correct plugin, which is the one circled red, is WFS2 uh, client plugin. If you use it and then ask by means of uh, get feature info, you derived all the necessary info. You are able to classify according to classes. You are able to visualize uh, x link elements, which is not that uh, easy, but you are able to do that if you use the correct one, uh, plugin. So we were able to use for all uh, the data set, no matter the data theme involved. And this also WFS usability in ArcGIS. And you can see that also in this case, the information is available and uh, WFS uh, correctly display. Uh, what about WMS? WMS we created correctly display both in QGIS and ArcGIS environment. So, uh, last minute and no, uh, open issues. We are just to the issues, so we are going to conclude. Uh, out of memory for big GML files. So, so when a uh, great huge amount of data is involved or when uh, many less nesting levels are present in the application schema, uh, pan-European data set can easily reach uh, tens of gigabytes. Uh, it, it surprised us that the most uh, um, 
uh, easy to handle uh, data set was biogeographical regions. It turns out in only 66 megabyte file. So we were able to validate the entire data set and uh, we uh, have no uh, troubles at all, at all in setting up the services and so on. Uh, but when um, schema is complex, uh, and, and so big files are derived, this hinders the validation of the complete data set and as well as the retrieving of selected feature info in GIS environment. Uh, we have also out of memory troubles when ingesting huge GML files in uh, degree in uh, SQL feature store. And we also tried an interesting uh, feature by Hale that is the WFST. So we tried to upload directly from our project in Hale, from the transformation project, the features in the instance, on in degree instance, and uh, it seems very promising. It's not yet perfect, but we can uh, see what can be done. Okay, uh, of course, this is an issue that can be maybe overcome considering national data set exposed one by one and for example cascading with WFS and so on. Many, many things can be taught. <laughs> uh, but okay, this is not the right time to discuss about that. Um, the nesting depth of the element. Uh, when the upschema structure extends a certain complexity with the nesting and recursion and many nesting levels within the same element, uh, configuration files uh, automatically created by the software, such as degree, for example, but the same for the others, uh, need to be manually edited. So you have to be skilled somehow to be able to derive the correct uh, GML uh, structure, but it can be done. So conclusion, it's the same old story. So the, the glasses are full or half empty. So uh, if you are an orange fish, like I think I am, uh, you can think that the most uh, has already been done. We are more than half away. Let's say we are in the home stretch. And uh, of course, there are some troubles related to the dimension of the files. Um, but uh, in this case, this is uh, something that could be discussed, argued with software developers. We really need software developers. If there are software developers, I can see many uh, in this room. Uh, go on the um, IONET platform or thematic cluster, read the documents, and support us when needed. So thank you. Thank you very much. It is amazing how one can stretch the term of the last minute. <laughs> um, thank you very much again. Um, yes, uh, for, the, for the sake of time, we have a bit over time. I would say uh, if you have questions, please contact uh, the, the technical project team, Stefania and Krupp, uh, the people you see here, uh, also Torsten Wrights, um, and you can address the question to us. Uh, and please have a look at the at web page where the project results are publicly available and provide us feedback either directly or on the thematic clusters. Thank you very much, Stefania. So, so uh, the next uh, presentation brings us to a completely different field, heritage management uh, from Poland. Hello, brother. Good afternoon. 
I must say that uh, my presentation will be slightly different than the other ones because I skipped all the uh, schema, all the UML uh, diagrams, so I hope you will be not disappointed about my presentation. Um, let me start with uh, introducing myself. Uh, my name is Arkadiusz Kołodziej and uh, I work for the National Heritage Board of Poland. I am here with you today to tell you about our activities connected with implementing the INSPIRE directive in the area of protected sites. As you have probably guessed already, we deal with the area of actions related to creating solution dedicated to national heritage, mostly uh, to the immovable and archaeological monuments. Sorry. Our institution is uh, directly subordinate to the Ministry of Culture and National Heritage of Poland, which supervises our institute and is directly responsible as so-called responsible body of, for implementing the provisions of the directive in the area of immovable monuments. In the institute, I am responsible for small nine people, but very dynamic team of experts, mostly cartographers, GIS experts, analysts, photogrammetrists, IT specialists, who are responsible for designing and implementing the solution about which I would like to tell you today. In case you are interested in what is on the, on the picture, this is not a sketch of the, of the monuments, this is uh, the point cloud, 3D point cloud derived from our measurement uh, team. So uh, we are also responsible for collecting the 3D data and I will show you how we can uh, show this data together with the INSPIRE data later on. The register of monuments has been created for almost 100 years. Imagine that. Uh, the oldest uh, decisions are from 1927, March 1927. As you have probably guessed, the register of monuments is very heterogeneous and to this day it is maintained in the analog paper form. There is often information missing about exact location of the monuments, location outline. Implementation of the INSPIRE directive was the first and the effective impulse which caused this database to be effectively organized and structured into the digital form for the very first time in history. The basic component parts of Poland Geospatial Database are four data series. They comprise of information. Uh, the first one, this is, these are the objects entered into UNESCO World Heritage List, which I think do not need more exposure. Everybody knows uh, these objects. Uh, the second group is uh, Monuments of History, the special category of the 60 most important historical objects in Poland, established by a Monument of History Protection Act. The third data series is immovable monuments, traditionally meant as architecture, urban complexes, rural complexes, other historical structures. The four data series, this is the archaeology, uh, for example, Hereford's, the settlements, etc. This beautiful picture you can see on the on the screen, this is the Fortress Boyen in Giżycko, the beautiful city of Poland. You are invited to see this place, this beautiful one. Uh, I must admit that in total, to date, the historical monuments database contains information about 93,000 structures within the data series, as well as over 84,000 scanned documents, entries to the register of monuments defining the protection of these structures. The work on digitalizing the register of monuments has begun quite late, in 2013. It required building an entire infrastructure from scratch, both technical for collecting digital data and the database management system. The first issue was, uh, we tackled was finding an effective and efficient method of converting the analog documentation into digital form. The goal was to create a tool for managing digital copies of administrative decisions that would be easy to operate by non-experts. Moreover, we were wondering how, at the stage of simple procedure of scanning the documents, to enrich the metadata of documentation with spatial data. In order to do this, we have developed and implemented a tool called Scan Manager. The tool integrates spatial reference data like register of boundaries, gazetteers, uh, street uh, names, and addresses. 
As a result, non-experts effectively use the administrative, administrative registers, geographical names, streets, and address points, so that at the later stage, interpreting the exact location of a structure on the map was quick and easy. In situations where the scanning person was able to determine the address number of a building based on registered data, the effectiveness of identifying the object on map was very precise and unambiguous. In practice, it turned out that the minimal determinable level of identification due to lack, due to lack of decision standardization was the name of locality. The essential issue in every GIS project is to determine the information supply of databases storing the spatial data. In this meaning, the essential issue is that the groups involved in creating such solutions understand each other correctly. In practice, it means for us the necessity of communication between groups of engineers and humanists, like art historians, which naturally was not easy. From my own experience, I would like to stress that this stage of work was crucial for creating a community of uh, future data users and co-creators. I would like to point now to some of the most interesting issues related to designing information data structures. We use INSPIRE as a framework upon which we attempted to create a system for efficiently managing historical monuments data. In practice, it means employing almost all the information addressed to heritage and provided in the full schema. You remember, we have a simple schema and full schema in the protected sites data model. So in my experience, almost 80% of full schema was uh, utilized in our data model in, and implemented in, the, in, this, in this solution. The technical specification for INSPIRE. Each structure defined on the map has a set of linked documentation defining its legal protection. Just imagine if you click on the map on the, on the specific object, the art historian can obtain full information about the object, full the documentation, and of course we have a set of attributes describing the, each of the objects. Another question raised, what is more important? Legal status or current knowledge about the monuments arising from the verification of the state of conservation? Both information about the legal status and current knowledge about the monuments arising from current state of research is significant. A mon monument data management system should allow for comparing this information and um, as a result facilitate updating the contents of administrative decisions. This is very interesting what you can see on the screen. You can see the situation where the current topographic content has been compared with the data from the administrative decision from 1952. You know, you see the localities up there. This exact um, site is also enlisted in archaeological register, right? I don't know what we should do, but this tool just let us identify such an information. Publishing data is uh, an inseparable and one of the crucial elements of our geographical information management system. It should be noted that the information gathered by National Heritage of Poland is not used exclusively by experts but also or primarily by people who are going on a weekend excursion and want to find information about surrounding historical monuments. The manner of presenting data, the methods of data portrayal, of course, are defined in detail in the INSPIRE uh, data technical specification. However, in my personal opinion, this visualization appears to be quite unclear in terms of indicating the type of historical monuments, its chronology, etc. So, uh, therefore, we sold effective methods of presenting monument data. What's interesting is that we managed to find good models in a work from 1967. Imagine that. The book of Professor Adam Jobensky called Atlas of, Mon of Monuments of Ar Architecture. To that end, we used the concept of graphic signs representing different kinds of historical monuments. Let me show you how does it look like. Moreover, we made sure to implement the manner of presenting data by aggregating information to so-called cartographic matrix. That way we adapted the means of presenting data on, old, on uh, uh, old maps, where the quantitative and qualitative characteristics regarding the number of structures and phenomena 
were assigned to a specific locality. Additionally, the GeoPortal dynamically displays the number of structures in the map window in current zoom. That way we managed to clearly present what's really interesting is in a given area of pole. You can see the cartographic matrix. If you zoom, zoom out, zoom in, the aggregation is dynamic. It aggregates the information to the specific uh, administrative units. So you can see the uh, total number of the monuments in the Voivodeship. If you zoom in, you can see how many uh, objects are in the communes, etc. And uh, the last example, this is the nice example how the interoperation looks like. You can see the archaeological monuments and the uh, whole aspect of the attributes of the of the sites uh, and the underlying data. Um, you can see the topographic maps and the LIDAR data. Uh, I have to admit that this map uh, get a, a give a uh, great rumor in the um, in the ar archaeologist uh, environment. They were searching for a possible localis localization of the archaeological sites on this map. Today, internet presence is very important. Having, mind, having in mind our obligation in giving propagation of knowledge about heritage, we sought a solution to present various resources, special information, our activity regarding historical monuments documentation in the form of 3D scanning in appealing manner. The answer to this is www.zabytek.pl. If you have a computer, you can point your browser to the, to the site and you can see how we are able to show the spatial data in this manner. Uh, this web portal was launched in 2016. Uh, at this moment, it contains information about more than 24,000 historical monuments. Each location is complete with a picture and basic information about the monuments straight from the Inspire database. At this moment, 10% of object has complete monument description drafted by Institute Inspect. You may ask, where is the GeoPortal? Here it is. It communicates with the WMS uh, data services, so you can see all the richness of spatial data, the photographs, the description, and also data models, uh, sorry, 3D, uh, 3D point clouds on this side. Uh, what's interesting, a significant portion, portion of uh, the pictures uh, comes from a community project Wikilove's Monuments. The project organized by Wikimedia Foundation was carried out between 2000 and 2014. Just imagine that within one month of September of each of these years, tens of thousands of pictures of historical monuments were gathered by enthusiasts. Integration of data collected under the project was only possible because the Institute has shared the registers of objects with constant identifiers at the beginning of the project. That is the sole reason the integration of data between the Inspire database and the community project was possible. And one, sli one last slide, uh, just the sum up of my today's presentation. To conclude today's presentation, I'd like to uh, sum up several selected issues which can be common for various projects involving implementation of INSPIRE not only in national heritage. INSPIRE is a funda foundation upon which we should beat, build uh, tools that are tailored for specific context, target, groups and use, which allow to engage the community not only professionals but also enthusiasts of a given discipline. It is important because knowledge is a sum of experiences of many different communities involved in the, in the creating geospatial databases. On every stage, we should involve users in the process of actively co-participating co and being co-responsible for developing solutions and the quality of developed data. It is not easy, but therefore fascinating. If the tools are designed to be simple, intuitive, and easy to use, they can be successfully used by non-professionals, but not less with great knowledge in a given discipline. And the last conclusion, uh, this example with the old map, innovation is the new old. Sometimes known and seeming archaic solutions are extremely difficult to implement, and the results are very interesting and surprising. I hope I, I picked up a little bit uh, a curtain. So, of course, if you have a question to me, you can ask. I will be available in the break. So.
for the food task. Thank you very much. Uh, are there questions? I actually would have again a question. Uh, I have a personal relationship with heritage, so I worked nine years uh, in, in the field of rescue archaeology. So uh, not everybody uh, who worked in archaeology is a lost case in terms of GIS. So I'm really happy uh, to see that, uh, that you made a very interesting uh, application and a very intuitive application based on Inspire standards. Yeah. Um, if I understood you correctly, you used the protected sites full uh, schema and you not ex had to extend it for your purpose. Yes, of course, yes. We extended this full schema. I don't remember the exact attributes, but uh, as I said, we talked to the people who are experts in this discipline, so they yeah. just you know, uh, pointed, we should have this information, this information, the logical uh, interaction between the objects are like that, yeah? Yeah. So we tried to listen to them and, and implement this, yeah. this solution. Thank you. I'm, I'm not surprised because uh, in the past we often discussed with former colleagues the use of uh, protected sites for archaeological or heritage purpose because there it is very, the connection is very thin and there were various uh, extensions already available from Scotland, mm -hmm. uh, from Spain, etc. Um, I would like to ask you also to add your, um, your documentation to the extending the data model uh, to the inventory of Inspire extensions. So extending use cases uh, which we are uh, which we are currently undoing. So I will give you uh, some information whom to contact if you are willing yes. to share this. Yes, it would yes, be really course. great to have this. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you very much again. And we are coming to the next presenter. Just a second. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So, my name is Lucian Zavate. I will give the next presentation. I was really impressed by the previous one. Good job, really. So, <coughs> I will talk about expanding the, the Romanian SDI. So I will try to be brief, as we are already over. Um, what the, the, the items that I'm going to talk about uh, is the current state of play, or actually the state of play in Romania when we began implementing, uh, when we began expanding the, the SDI, and you'll see that I'm uh, referring to a second Inspire node in Romania. What were the project implementation steps? What were the results? And also, what is the roadmap? So when we actually began doing this project, uh, we had just one Inspire node in Romania. It was one supported by uh, NCPI, which is the National Agency for Cadastral and Land Registration. It was the Romanian Inspire GeoPortal. It, was a it is a multi-tenant GeoPortal, and it allows uh, uh, all of the <coughs> Inspire contributors in Romania to edit and manage their metadata documents. Also, the uh, GeoPortal is registered with the European Commission Inspire GeoPortal through uh, CSW. Um, so that GeoPortal is giving access to um, a few network resources, such as, as previously mentioned, the Discovery Service, Inspire View Service, and Inspire Download Services for five uh, data themes, like administrative units, cadastral parcels, hydrography network, transportation network, and geographical names. You see that I emphasize geographical names. Uh, it is because at that time, NECPI was, uh, uh, was serving that service, but it was undertaken by uh, DTM. DTM is the Military Topographic Directorate. So my presentation is about implementing a second Inspire node in Romania. This is supported by the Ministry of Defense, and it was a challenging. Uh, project because it was the also first time when they actually were hosting things and making them available for others and providing services. Uh, they wanted to provide access to Inspire resources and also they wanted to federate the newly created uh, Inspire node with the existing one. Um, we actually started from scratch from all points of view. Let's, the data, they already had the data, but in other terms we started from scratch. 
the infrastructure, the software, everything from scratch. And um, we, we um, had a few um, challenges, but in the end we, we overcame them. One of the things that was a little bit daunting was harmonizing the existing data. We are already serving auto imagery. We are responsible for flying, uh, uh, for providing auto imagery for the Ministry of Agriculture for EU. Um, um, it slips me. The, um, ah. the European Commission gives subsidies for agriculture, so they are responsible for. We are responsible for flying and providing auto imagery for Romania. We are also responsible for elevation and, as I told you, geographical names. So during the uh, implementing the project, we, we had to deal with all sorts of uh, all so sorts of things. As I told you, we had to create a new infrastructure. You have here a brief uh, description of their uh, current uh, architecture. You'll see that we created and we designed this uh, with uh, business continuity in mind. We also had to take care of non-functional requirements that Aspire has, like quality of services, high availability, capacity, security, and so on. Um, the approach was quite straightforward, but we, uh, we uh, preferred to also have um, an architecture that allows us to scale out to add additional, um, additional capacity as needed. As I told you, this was built on top of their existing um, uh, S3 software, so we used the WebGIS approach. I will not discuss too much about it. They already had parts of the software, and the only thing that they added was RGS for Inspire that allowed them to actually um, um, migrate the, the existing data and uh, to provide the web services that they were required to do so. The <coughs> data harmonization step was as I told you, a bit daunting, but in the end, we, we managed to get it through. Uh, the RGS for Inspire had, uh, has support only for geographical names, so we had to develop the auto imagery and elevation on our own based on the specification. Uh, they also helped a lot. I was surprised they have quite an experience in, in working with data schemas and standards because they are part of uh, <coughs> international projects such as MGCP or UN directives and so on, so it, it was quite a good um, technical partner. I was very much um, impressed by them. So we took all of their existing uh, information, such as, as I told you, they, they are responsible for flying and providing auto imagery. They also had elevation based on accurate measurements and geographical names. We took their existing data. We created some ETLs, as some of my colleagues, my, my colleague presenters previously showed you. Some ETL recurring processes that allows them to um, harmonize the data each time we have an update. Still here, you, you don't see too many updates. Auto imagery is being renewed every three years. Elevation is not so quite dynamic and geographical names is kind of the same because this is, this is something that is, um, uh, it has not so, it is not so dynamic. We previously implemented the, the other five teams that you saw and those were a bit more challenging because we had Li object life cycle management issues and stuff like that. So here from this point of view, much easier. So as a result, I told the geographical names, we provide, uh, we, we uh, managed to get the data in Inspire compliant uh, um, format, the simple, the simple uh, implementation for geographical names and also with network services such as download and um, review service. Inspire compliant and the metadata, you can see here um, a snapshot. Also auto imagery, and here I have a few other words to share with you. So initially we just wanted to provide the WMS service uh, in Inspire compliant, but then we realized that they already had different other obligations toward uh, other uh, internal um, um, government agencies. So in the end we, we, we managed in providing two services, one Inspire compliant, fully Inspire compliant, and the other one in national um, coordinate system. This happened because there are some penalties when you try to, to serve dynamically or to imagery for several uh, companies. So we, we, had to, we had to double this one, unfortunately. Still, we also optimized, also optimized the services, expanded and used WMTS. 
it behaves okay and we had no complaints so far. Um, there are a few issues, but no, nothing critical. Um, elevation, mm, I haven't seen them, I mean, they are using it, but I haven't seen other agencies using the services, hopefully to happen in the near future. Uh, you can see here the, the um, what they are providing. It is based on their um, measurements and uh, on their previous data sets that they managed. Also, in this project, we dealt with some non-inspired data. They had lots of topographic, uh, topographical map, different editions, different scales, and we wanted to convert all of these from analog format to uh, digital format. They scanned them, and we have full coverage to, from 1 to 25,000 to 1 to 1 million, as you can see here. This is also available as a network service. It's not an inspired compliant network services, but it, it can be used as WMS and it can be used in conjunction with, with other uh, services. The geo portal itself is just a snip, sheet, a snip here. You can always go and visit it. It's, it's public. And I told you it was something new for them also to provide services. And as I told you in the map, we, we have coverage for auto imagery. We also have the near infrared here, the second one, if you can see it. And the, um, uh, I think the elevation is missing here. Yeah, it's missing. Probably it's an old. And also the um, topographic maps. So, as I told you, as a result, we have a new Inspire node in Romania, which is federated with the Inspire Geo Portal, the Romanian Inspire Geo Portal. We have two new compliant Inspire data themes that we can add to our country portfolio. It's like auto imagery elevation. And we have, we managed to get Inspire compliant network services like discovery services, view services, download services, but still there are some issues here. Um, we, we also saw this in the other project. Even though they have these uh, services ready and available, they still cannot make it publicly for free available because those data sets, they are existing data sets and they are being, um, uh, they are selling the, those data and it is not allowed for them to provide the data for free if it is already. So there are some laws that need to be changed in order to be able to um, provide ac full access to the, these data sets. Roadmap, so we are trying to maintain existing data sets and synchronize with Inspire database, but the, dy the dynamicity is not so, so high. They are planning to add additional content, and I think one of the most important things is to develop some useful, useful application on top of the content and network services. And actually, put them to, to work because so far they are providing them as support for other agency and they, they have um, identified some opportunities for themselves. I try to be a little short, hopefully, so nobody minds, I think. If you have any questions, I can just uh, repeat, do you have any questions? Nobody wants to be the first question of the session. Um, I understood that some of your some of your data sets are free available and some are restricted. Geographical um, names, yeah. Yeah. Okay, geographical names is is, op is restricted. No, it's fully available for also fully for available. download and viewing. Yeah, for the um, for the publicly available data sets. Do you have a quantification of the of the user of the access of the user uptake? Of the uh, well, I haven't thought of it, but I can I can always check it. Now okay. we, we we managed to get this free um, a couple of months ago, yeah. so um, all of the modification that they have to do regarding their data needs to go by a ministry order. It's it's different, and this is military. All of the data that you see, we managed to put out there, had to go through a declassifying process first, even yeah. though. You, it's, I, so things are moving a bit slow from these points of view. Okay, but thank you very much. Uh, from what we saw, it's already uh, almost half of uh, of Annex One. Yeah. So uh, this is a good sign for progress, and to progress to the last presentation of today, which brings us in the field, if I understood correctly, environmental data and linked data. Where is the colleague from Poland? Ah, there. Sorry. <laughs> 